Welcome to Grace or Grit. Tonight's topic is the Peterbilt truck and the VW. We know forgiveness and justification are all Jesus and all by faith and grace alone. But what about sanctification? Getting victory over sin? All Jesus? Or is that a partnership, collaboration, cooperation? Join Pastor Dan Smith and Ganem Hanna and let's explore these questions now. Hello again and welcome to our four-part series of Grace or Grit with guest speaker Pastor Dan Smith. Welcome again. How are you, Ganem? I am blessed. And you, my friend? I'm all right. You Happy sure, to be here. Good to have you here. You sure blessed us with your message from the first episode. Well, today, part two. Thank you. And we're looking to the second part. What's, what's the topic today? Uh, Maury called it, Maury Vinden called it, uh, the Peterbilt parable. And uh, so don't just, uh, don't just do something. Stand there. The opposite of what we usually say it. Don't just sit there, do something. Right. And he would flip it around. Don't just uh, hmm. do something, stand there. Okay. So we'll see what you think when we're done. We, we look forward to that message. I know you mentioned Maury Vendon several times yesterday. Yes. And you mentioned him today for those who are watching us for the first time. What's the relationship? So Maury, well, my mother's first cousin. We called him uncle because he's the next generation above right. us. Uh, so... For those who don't know, you know, he was a minister for 50 years in the Adventist Church. Uh, pastored the La Sierra University Church before me. His picture's up on the wall, the few before me. Maury really, uh, out of his own experience and then uh, at La Sierra Church, uh, was revolutionary in the Adventist Church, talking about righteousness by faith. Hmm. And not just that we're saved in our forgiveness by faith, but we live the life, the Christian life, by faith alone. And that really is a message that uh, his son and my cousins and I don't want to see die, even though he's passed away. Right. So they're going on the road. They speak all over the country. Uh, my cousin Lee goes in night-night little blocks of time all over. He's scheduled out five yeah. years from now. Uh, Lee and uh, my cousin Gary is doing it uh, once in a while. So I'm not going to do that. But I thought, you know, you give me four days. You're going to do it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep that alive. So, you know, it's a mix of Maury and, and Dan Smith and right. things we think about. But he's the one who really was a champion for this for, mm. for 50 years. He was pastor here down the street at Azure Hills. That's he would good. preach two Sabbaths and then go on the road for the other two Sabbaths and speak. Because he, he cared so much about this, yeah. this one idea that it's all by faith. Well, I see that seed in you as well, <laughs> the, 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 the more abundant seed, which, by the way, to our, for our viewers, uh, all his recorded series, I would say all he recorded series, it still airs on LBN, and it's also available on our website. You mm -hmm. can go to our website and, 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 and enjoy each and every episode he recorded. Uh, well, I'll tell you, let's take a little short break, because no program can start without outstanding music. And our outstanding music today comes from a dear friend and beloved one here, Gigi Novell. The best. Uh, she is, and she just loved this ministry with all her heart and loved to come here and lift up the Lord's name through her music. Huh, yeah. What are you singing for us today? I am singing God Still Delivers. He has been delivering people since the beginning of time, and he's still doing that today for Amen. all of us. Amen. 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 Let's hear it. Okay. by doubt you see no way out in spite of all you believe your options are gone the odds are so strong but friend don't trust what you see for the God of the past is the God of today and he can still make way God still delivers he still calms the stormy sea. He still moves mountains and he sets the captive free. What he did back then he will do again. His mercy endures forever. Great or small, he still does them all. 
Never let go, no matter what lies ahead. He brought others through, and he'll rescue you. He promised to do what he said. For the God of the past is the God of today, and he can still make a way. If you ever wanted to come to your church, just contact LLBN, speak with Jay Hughes, and he'll make the arrangements for you. Mm. Now, how could it. this not set the tone for your sermon? You always find a way to make that happen. It's the power of the Holy Spirit brings and, it together. And, and I don't know if you have 10 seconds I can say sure. this, but yeah, I talked last night about this singing group that I found over in the Philippines this last time. Right. And they, they sing for the Thousand Missionary Movement, and, and they're just fantastic. But they have 50 songs uh, that they can sing by memory. Mm. And, and every single one was just fantastic. And I, they asked me to say something uh, at the last night concert. And I just said, not only are they terrific and the singers are terrific, but whoever writes these songs, okay. you know, they're just filled. God still delivers. Yeah. It's just a great message. Okay. And uh, the music is good. The background is good. The singer is great. But somewhere there's a gift of the songwriter who sits down on the piano and writes these songs with wonderful lyrics. And, and I just want to honor that uh, somewhere. Well, it's a gift well, from God. Well said. It is indeed a gift of God. And we're so blessed by it here at Noel LBN through so many, so many musicians like Gigi and others. Well, Pastor, I'm going to carry the stand, set it up for you. I'll walk off stage. My time. And I'll join you back when you're done. All right. Well, hello everybody, hello be in land. It's an honor to uh, to get to do here four four in a row live on LOBN, and uh, so we'll see what you what you think of this. If you've been following my life at all, we've been talking uh, two or three times here. I've had shows with uh, Ganem that I retired a couple months ago, and uh, everyone asked me, "What are you going to do with your retirement, Pastor Dan?" So I, I've kind of thought maybe I would start my own church, my own denomination now. I'm free. I've done my 45 years. I got my, my retirement. I can do whatever I want. We're not going to have 28 fundamental beliefs anymore. We're just going to have one fundamental belief. I'm going to read it to you. The basic idea is we're not going to do anything that's hard anymore. I'm done with that. I'm not working out anymore. 
and not going to try to change anything in my life. I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm not going to worry about any rules. I'm not going to have any flossing. I'm not going to go jogging. I'm not going to worry about what I eat. If I want to eat ice cream for breakfast, that's no problem. I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to be free. Tired of the little narrow road they talk about. Tired of always having to go uphill. I'm going to go downhill if I'm not. I'm never going to sweat again. Done with that. Going to wear what I want to wear. No more suits, as you can see. Going to wear sweatshirts, T-shirts, tennis shoes. Not going to care about what anybody else thinks anymore. If I want to watch something, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to sign up for HBO and Showtime on cable. Not going to worry about music. I'm going to listen to whatever I feel like listening to. If I want to play golf on Sabbath, I'm going to go skiing. If I want to watch college football, I'm going to do it in my new church. I'm going to go to Las Vegas. I'm going to play the slot machines. I'm going to go to all the shows. I am not going to fight anymore. I'm not going to resist any temptation that comes my way. Fighting is over. I'm going to go with the flow. I'm going to go with the traffic instead of fighting against it. Tired of being different, tired of being weird. You only live once. <laughs> Why spoil it all by always having to say no? Always struggling to change and to somehow get better, to sacrifice, work to improve. I'm not going to worry about heaven anymore. I make my own heaven down here. If it turns out there is a heaven, I hope I get in. But I'm not going to obsess about it. I'm not going to hurt anybody. So how do you feel? You going to join my, my new church? You like my new church? No, that's just an idea, but uh, it's been a debate for a long time. Is the Christian life, the normal Christian life, supposed to be this battle where you were fighting, where you were fighting like you're going uphill all the time? Or is it supposed to be a little easier? Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Or is it deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me? Is it saved by grace or is it work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? Is it believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? Or is it be thou faithful unto death and I will grant you a crown of life? Anyway. I hope you have the issue now in front of you that we're wrestling with this week, grace or grit. Probably if you had to look at uh, Maury Vinden for those who have uh, grown up with him, the one parable that he's probably the most famous for is the Peterbilt parable. He did a lot of parables, and I certainly can't tell it uh, like him, and he took uh, quite a while to tell it that we maybe don't have enough time. He loved talking about going to New York and standing up on the Empire State Building, looking out over the lights of the city. And a famous billionaire was kind of next to him, and he said, hey, I'll make you a deal. I'll give you a million dollars on two conditions. One, you got to spend it all in one year. You don't get to save any of it. you got to spend it all. And after the one year, you have to meet me right here on the Empire State Building, and you have to jump. And if you don't jump, I'll push you. You want my million dollars? Well, don't think I want to do that. I walked away. As I got in the elevator to go down, a man came onto the elevator with me who was dressed in white. Somehow it looked familiar that I'd seen him somewhere. He says, I see that you like the lights of the city. Let me tell you about another fantastic city. You want to go? He said, you know how to get there? Yes, I know the way. I'm the only one, really, that knows the way. How far is it? Well, it's 105 trillion miles away. Well, then another man got on the elevator. He's all in black. Black suit, black hat, black beard, everything was black. And he said, I've got a city too. How far is it to your city? 
it's only four hours. And so I took him up on his offer, and I flew out to Las Vegas. I bought a Jaguar. I drove all over the city for 30 days. I did everything. I went to every show, whatever there was to do it in Las Vegas. I did it. But after 30 days, ah, it just wasn't much fun anymore. It was, I, I, uh, I was sick of it. It's got to be more than this. So I thought maybe I'll go to the other man's city. I drove out of Las Vegas and I saw the sign, there it was, 105 trillion miles. I said, okay, I better get going. It's a big road, it's four lanes. I began to go toward the fabulous city, 105 trillion miles. I thought, I better go 150 miles an hour. But somehow there didn't seem to be anyone else going my way. Everyone <laughs> seemed to be going the other direction. And I'm trying to weave through all of this traffic coming my way. But it was just too hard. I finally said, I better get over on the shoulder. But now I couldn't go 150 miles an hour anymore. I'm down to 20 miles an hour. How am I going to get to 105 trillion miles to 20 miles an hour? All of a sudden, this huge Peterbilt truck came around the corner. And I just couldn't get out of the way fast enough. Smashed in me. And I sort of came to, here was this man. It's a man in the white suit. He says, uh, you want me to drive for you? I said, my car smashed up. I said, don't worry, I can fix it. He fixed my car back up, and he got in the car. He doesn't drive on the shoulder. He comes back onto the highway, and somehow when he's driving, all these cars and trucks get out of the way. We, we're going 150 miles an hour. I said, wow, look at that. After a while, I watched him drive. He I kind of got the hang of it. And I said, I think I can see how to do that now. Could, could I drive? He said, okay, got out of the way. He let me drive. Sure enough, here all these trucks came at me again. And I'm over on the shoulder. And I said, maybe, maybe you better drive from now on. But I kept looking at how he drove. And finally, I thought, I really had it now. He always let me take the wheel whenever I wanted. I could take the wheel. So I began to drive again, and I back 150 miles an hour, and I'm going, and all of a sudden, another Peterbilt came around the corner. It had a load of hay. And when I looked in the windshield, I could see it was the same man, the black man with the beard and the hat and all of that, driving on the way. And he smashed into my car. He got me again. I went off to the side. And the man in white said, you want me to drive for you this time? Yes, yes, yes. So as long as I let him drive, he did really good. We're back up to 150 miles an hour. And then I saw what looked like Disneyland off to the side. I knew he wasn't going to drive over there. So I tapped him on the shoulder. I said, could, could I drive just for a moment? Sure. Got out of the way. He let me drive. So I went off the freeway. I wanted to go to Disneyland. It looked so good with all the lights. But somehow I missed the curve and I went over a cliff and I'm all smashed up again. And he said, one more time. You want me to do it? He fixed the car up. We got back on the highway. After a little ways, I looked back. What I thought was going to be Disneyland and going to be so much fun was going up in smoke. And I said, learn your lesson. Keep your grubby hands off the wheel. Let the man in white drive. And every time we passed another car, I looked all out and I said, you ought to see my driver. And we began to make it 150 miles an hour to the fabulous city. My generation loved that parable. We were tired of driving on the highway, trying to fight the traffic 
and fight the trucks and fight the temptations. The idea that you could give your life over to Jesus and get out of the way and let him drive was so exciting to my generation. But there were those who got angry with that parable. It seemed too passive, too, too quiet. Is that really the normal Christian life, that you just sit off to the side and let Jesus do all the driving? Don't we need to be doing something? I had one man say to me, he said, Pastor Dan, you're preaching a jacuzzi theology. It's too easy. There's something we have to do. They call that rocking chair religion, cruise control religion. God helps those who help themselves. Isn't that in the Bible somewhere? No. You can't just sit there and expect Jesus to do all the work. And more even than would have people line up at the camp meetings to argue with him. But his answer was always, you're not just sitting there. You're the car. You're the and You're driving. You're going. You're, you're active. We're not just sitting there. But Jesus is the driver. He is the engine. He is the gas. He is the one in charge. And you have given over a significant part of running your life to Jesus. And when you let Jesus run your life, Satan and the temptations get out of the way. And Maury died for this idea, is that if you let Jesus run your life, you will never lose to Satan again. Very controversial. A lot of people argued with him. Galatians 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live by faith in the Son of God. And he said it should not feel hard anymore. It should feel easy. More uncle loved telling the story when they were in college, a last year university, just down the road where I live. Back in the day, he said he roomed with his brother Lou. My Uncle Lou is down the street in the villa where my mother is. In her late 80s now, my mother's 90. They were all at La Sierra University College together back then. And Lou fell in love with my Aunt Margie. Margie was at Glendale going to a nursing school, I think, 60, 70 miles away. There was no freeway. <laughs> they didn't have a car. But they were in love, and Maury will say that one night Lou just wanted to go see Margie. You couldn't just call up back in those days. It wasn't that simple. He said it was fog out at night, and he wanted to see Margie. So he said, Lou walked out of our dorm. He said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to go see Margie. It's 70 miles away, Lou. I don't care. I'm going to go. What would ordinarily feel very hard somehow felt easy when you're in love. I'm going to walk 70 miles. When you're in love with Jesus, changes everything in the Christian life. He said, it should not feel hard. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Steps to Christ, page 61. More I got a lot from Steps to Christ. If we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in us, our feelings, our thoughts, our purposes, our actions will be in harmony with the will of God. See? should feel easy when you're in love and you have a relationship with Jesus. One of the passages Moore began to preach on at La Sierra College in the early 1970s started a revival all over our church. The passage in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the story of Jehoshaphat. Maybe you know the story. We're going to do this in like five minutes. Righteousness by faith. These principles of righteousness by faith that are all in this passage. 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It says in verse 1, after this, the armies of the Moabites and the Ammonites and some of the Meunites declared war on Jehoshaphat and his country. So, number one, we're in a war and we are surrounded. We're in a battle. You ever feel like that? It was three countries against one. The enemy is all around you. 
You ever feel like we're in a war? I just came back from the Philippines. You do a mission trip, and <laughs> there are days you just feel like this is a war. Rain every night, right when we began to have the meetings. People would come back to breakfast and say, Pastor Dan, we were just pouring rain. Rain on the roof. Even in my huge church where I was, you just see the rain was so loud, I had to shout to finish my last five minutes of the sermon. Gigi, the song worked perfectly tonight. I can tell you how many times the last two weeks my singer would get up in front to make the appeal song and would stand there for five minutes while the sound system made terrible sounds and everyone's running over there trying to make the track work. We're Satan. We're in a war. 5.30, we're at the dining room in the cafeteria. They wanted me to interview two young men from the radio station. I put my backpack down, had my computer, had everything. I went over there for the interview. I came back to go to preach to 600 people. My backpack's gone. Who took my backpack? One of the drivers at another site had taken my backpack, thought it was his pastor. It's an hour away. They texted everybody. My sermon, the pictures, my notes, everything in that backpack. Satan. They came back just before I got up to preach. Computer went dead in the middle of the sermon. I'm preaching and everything's gone. It's hard. There's days that it's hard. Then me on Mars. You fly 20 hours, you get off the plane. They put you in a truck and you bounce over these terrible roads for five hours and they put you in a little guest room. There's no desk, there's no table. I had to write my sermons on a little kindergarten chair, little, another chair to try to write my sermons on. And there's no cupboard for your clothes. So I found where there was a little hook where the picture was. I took the picture off. I hung all my clothes on that. Two o'clock in the morning, that thing broke. All that whole business f fell on the floor. I said, God, this is hard. You know, hot water. We're in a war. The demons are out there trying to stop us. I watched Life of Pi on the plane coming home. This poor kid is on a little life raft, and he's in a life raft with a tiger. You're in the middle of the ocean. You've got to share your life raft with a tiger. We're in life with a lion who's going around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We're in a war, and we're surrounded. Number two, it's hopeless. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12, Jehoshaphat said, We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us, and we do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. We've all tried to do it on our own. You've made promises, I've made promises. We're never going to yell at the kids again. We're not going to do that again on Saturday night. I'm never going to watch another movie like that. I'm never going to. I'm never going to use those words. I'm never going to. I'm going to work out every day. I am going to lose weight. I am going to. And you just can't do it. We're surrounded by an enemy. And we don't have the power to fight this by ourselves. How many exercise machines do you have around your house? And you vowed and promised, I'm going to do that every day. I'm going to walk three miles every day. I'm going to read a chapter of the Bible every day. Righteousness by faith starts with this. We don't have the power to do this by ourselves. Number three, the battle is the Lord. Second Corinthians Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. The Lord says, do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army. For the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord's. Can we hear that? And 50 years ago, as this message began to go across the country, I was in high school, senior in high school, and freshman in college. You have no idea how earth-shaking that was to find out the battle. All we knew was clenched teeth fighting. You've got to do better. You've got to keep these rules. You gotta be, if you want to go to heaven, you want to go to hell, you've got to... Do these things. And to find out that the battle is not the battle against Satan. The battle is the battle of faith. And then if you had a relationship with Jesus, Jesus would fight the battle for you. And here in Jehoshaphat at 2 Chronicles 20, 
Jehoshaphat says to these people, the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. He is going to fight for you. God's battle. Number four, stand firm and watch the Lord's victory. It says in verse 16, tomorrow, march out against them, but you will not need to fight. Take your positions and then stand still and watch the Lord's victory. More, this was his punchline, he would say. All most of us have ever heard is, <laughs> don't just sit there, do something. I would be on the paint crew at college, at Pacific Union College, if they didn't tell me what to do, I would just sit there. And our foreman would come and he said, what are you doing? I said, you didn't tell us what to do. He said, well, never just sit there, do something. Wash the brushes, do something. That's our American Puritan work ethic. But here when it comes to the gospel, don't do something. Stand there and watch Jesus fight the battle. All the way through the scriptures, there is this crazy combination. You go to Jericho. You just walk in a circle. And then when it comes the time, you shout. Oh, that's a good idea. That's going to win the battle here. That's going to make the walls come tumbling down. Let's shout. That's a good idea. Good idea, Joshua. Let's shout. Let's blow our trumpets. That'll be good. I just want you to do. You shout. And you watch God bring the walls come tumbling down. Naaman, what do you want me to do? You go into the water and you just go into the water seven times. Oh, that's great. That's a great cure. Go into the water. Peter. You go find a fish. Open up the mouth of the fish. You'll find the money for the taxes. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's a great idea where to find some money, God. Let's do that. Go catch a fish. Over and over again. Put some mud on your eyes. Go up on the roof and lower Jesus through. Yes, you have to do something, but what you have to do has nothing to do with the victory that's going to be won. Jesus is going to win this victory from beginning to end. You shout, he'll make the walls come tumbling down. You stand, you dunk under the water, he'll make the leprosy go away. It is going to be clear at the end of this, it's going to be all Jesus, all God. You stand still. God is going to win the victory for you. Number five, God wins every single time when you let him win the, fight the battle. It says there in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 24, after they marched, they put the choir up in the front. No one fought with anybody. They had the choir singing, and they all marched. And they came out in the morning. All they saw, it says, were dead bodies everywhere. Lying on the ground as far as they could see, not a single one of the enemy had escaped. My friend John Dibdahl is retired now, was a pastor, missionary in Thailand where we grew up, and uh, been president of Walla Walla, many powerful positions. Wrote a book on what they talk about, these Old Testament war traditions. And he studied all the different holy war motifs, they call it. Whenever Israel tried to fight like an AI, it was a disaster. And they lost, and lost lots of people. When they didn't fight at all, and then they let God do all the fighting, it was a complete victory, and they lost nobody. If they kind of did it in the middle, where they fought, but they also trusted in God, they would win, but a lot of people would die on both sides. And he would just say, if you want to win the battle without casualties, let God fight the battle. And God will win every single time. Slide over and let Jesus drive the car. Let him fight. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 392. It was not God's purpose that they should gain the land by warfare. God says, I will drive out the giants. I will knock down the walled cities. Let me, you just stand there. I will win. I'll give it to you. Oh, we want to fight. Quick little story that John Dibdahl used in the book about this. 
This is a place that I have done a lot of mission work in, and I grew up in Thailand. But John Dibdahl wanted to build a school in the northern Thailand. I've been there 50 times, Chiang Mai Adventist Academy. They flew the airplane with Ralph Watts, who's on the board here of LOBN. And they found this land, and they had to negotiate with 37 rice farmers. And they got those 37 rice farmers, and every single one had to sign to buy that land. They all signed. Now you got to clear this land. Now it's a developed school. It has 1,100 students. We built a church there in the ad building. <laughs> he was driving down the road, and they had an accident. Looked bad. As he got out of the car, he saw that this was a government truck that hit him. And he got an idea. He said to the guy, I'll fix my own car. It's your fault, but I'll fix my car if you will let me have the government bulldozer for four days. We'll pay us food. We'll pay us gas. You let us have the bulldozer. They did it. And that bulldozer <laughs> carved out that whole campus, made all the road that they're using today and where all the buildings are. Out of an accident, God did a miracle for nothing, for $60 it took to fix his car. And he says, if you'll just let God fight the battle, God will fight the battle, and he will win victory after victory. And Jesus can drive the car against traffic, and none of the cars will hit. And Maury stood for this, is that if you will give your life to Jesus and have a relationship with Jesus, he will win every victory. You never have to lose. People debated him, but here are the verses. Ephesians 6, 6, 16. Take up the shield of faith and you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ. Jude 24. Now unto him who was able to keep you from falling to present you faultless before him. God can do it all. And here is the core idea. Salvation is in these two parts. You come to Jesus and he forgives all your sins. And then you live a life where you have to get victory over sin. The Ferrari, the down payment and make the payments. Justification and sanctification. And we believe is that sanctification is the same as justification. It's by Jesus. It is by faith and by grace alone. It is Jesus from beginning to end. There is never a time we say, okay, that part's God, and now here's the part that I have to do, and I have to fight. It is Jesus. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He is all of it. And that's why at the end of the world, we will say, fear God and give glory to him. Because it's all Jesus, and there's nothing more. Let you think about it. You can ponder it and decide if you think it's true. We absolutely believe that we live a life, we're involved in this life of living a Christian life. But it is always the same. What he has begun in you, he will complete. He is the Alpha and the Omega. God bless you all. We we'll hope you'll come back again tomorrow night. And we're going to do four of these all wrestling with this issue. Is it grace or is it grit? And we will say it's by grace. It's all Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Good sermon, Pastor. All right. You probably had quite a few folks sitting on the edge of their seat when you opened up with your sermon. What's that? I'm sorry. You got a lot of people sitting on the edge of their seat <laughs> when you opened up with your sermon. With my I'm little sure new church. That. You want to be in my new church? But you had them, you had them on the edge of the seat as you finished <laughs> the sermon as well. People always want to ask me with my little parables, is that true, Pastor Dan? No. No. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. a good parable. You know, it is all about Jesus, and it's all about through Jesus. Because we all have tried so many things, even in this ministry. We've tried so many things our ways, and it was just, it just stalled. It wouldn't move forward. And that's what Dibdahl is saying. You can still win sometimes if you do your own thing and ask God to bless you. Right. And you can win and have good things happen, but there will be more casualties. Right. But if you will let God really carry all of it. We're still moving. doesn't mean we don't make phone calls. We, don't, we go to the computer. We work. We work. But you have a great sense that God is doing the driving. Then there's very few casualties. And there's just this opening up and triumphant and flourishing 
with the blessing of God. Mm. Amen. That's the now, I think we, those all of us who work in ministries, whether we volunteer or full-time, it doesn't matter, those who serve in a ministry must have seen God's work at one time or another when they submit and let go. And God just put all things in order. Uh, I tell you, I, I've tried so many things my way, and mm. it was difficult. And the times when I thought, eh, I'll just leave it in God and, and see what happened. Amazing things does happen. A simple phone call leads to multiple rewarding deals. A simple sidewalk conversation ends up building amazing things for the ministry because God was doing the work. How many times in ministry, a church, you know, where you're stuck between two groups of people. And if, you, if you do this, you're going to hurt these people. If you do this, you're going to hurt right. these people. And they're just at loggerheads. And I'll go home and say to Hilda, you know, I, I, don't, I don't see any way out of this. Yeah, how do you balance that? And, and, and you just, you're going you're gonna to win, win and lose. There's no, there's no win-win out of this. And a day or two later, there was a win-win. Hmm. And God did open up a way. And there was a way to kind of keep this group happy and not inflame this group. And uh, two days later, it's over and it's done and we moved on. And we were able to satisfy this meeting and that meeting that looked like they had to be at the same time. And we found a solution mm -hmm. when we let God. When I'm doing it in the human battle, then there's casualties. Yeah. My ca I'm a casualty. They're a casualty. There's, there's blood on the street. Yeah. You know? There's no win. <laughs> There's no one in that situation. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you say that because the question I have, what makes two sides, when they both believe they want to do something great for God, yeah. but then they clash rather than unite? Too bad. Is that, is that the, our own internal power that defeating us or is it the power of the enemy? Well, the, the two are pretty, pretty closely side related. Side by side, right? <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and these can be very godly people. You know, we're all in the process Absolutely. of sanctification and becoming victorious in Christ. And so let's say we start and we're 10% Jesus and 90% pretty human. And gradually we become 30, 50, 70%. But none of us are 100% yet. Right. And that part of us that is not sanctified, that has not been completely healed up with God, Satan can use that. And he can make havoc, and he does, in ministries and in church and in our families, marriages. And you'll say, these are good people. How can that happen? Well, uh, the highest leaders of our church are good people. They're getting up every morning trying to find, what can I do to make the church better? What can I do to advance the kingdom of God? But there are parts of their life and character that are not completely sanctified yet. And Satan can still use that, as he uses part of me, to, to mess things up. And we just say, God, complete. Give us victory because we don't have to give in to that. Maury's idea was we don't have to be in that constant percentage process. If we would be in a relationship with Jesus all day, every day, it says he will stop every flaming arrow of the evil one. To use his analogy, all the trucks coming and all the cars will get out of the way if we let Jesus drive. We drive, there's going to be some crashing. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll be off to the side healing up from it. Not everyone agreed with that. There was a lot of debate about that. But I think the scripture says pretty clearly, you know, Jesus was filled with God every day. Never sinned one single time. Satan are coming at him with the biggest temptations possible. Never yielded a single time. It is possible to live a victorious life if we're filled with Jesus. Mm. Well, yesterday I said, you know, when, when, when we listen to the Spirit of God, it rules our flesh. Yes. But when we let our flesh lead the spirit, we end up just... We're in trouble. We are in trouble. In he who trouble. is in you is greater than he is in the world. Yeah. Do we really want to say that Satan's got a few guns in his repertoire, just too big for Jesus? You know, it's just, oh, absolutely. They're just too big, you know? Yeah. And okay, okay, that's, yeah, okay, you just, can't, you just can't fight that one. No, he who is in you is greater than he was in the world every single time. And uh, Satan is a created being, and Jesus knows more and has more power. Mm -hmm. We either believe that or we don't. It's either true or it's not. Yeah. Well, we have to accept the fact as believer that God is a supernatural God and has all the supernatural powers. And he can rule, and he can change, and he can create, and he can destroy, and he can do anything he wants. Yeah. And he can put the enemy aside, and that he, he has done on many occasions, and including 
kicking him out of heaven <laughs> when, when he split the heavenly powers. And that's the, that's the metaphor is at the end of the world, there will be all the dead. Not one of Israel was lost and all the other side was lost. It's a metaphor yeah. for the end of the world. When all the righteous are saved and all everyone else is gone, that's what it's going to be. Mm. It's wonderful. Let's, let's pause right here. We'll come back and continue our conversation. But one more. Let's, let's see that Gigi is willing to do another song for us. Yes, sir. Thank you. What is this one called? Well, you know, it's, it's called His Eyes on the Sparrow. Mm. And I've heard it ever since I was a little girl. But it's, it was requested of me to sing for my friend's grandmother's service this coming weekend. And because I had to learn the words... It's so incredibly touching to me that I've, I've been feeling renewed to learning mm. this particular hymn and song. And so I decided I'm going to share it with the Elbian family. Thank you. I'll make this old song thank you. You're, renewed for you're each awesome. one of us. Dr. Novell. All right, thank you. Why should my heart be lonely? Why should the shadows fall? Why should my heart be lonely? for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion my constant friend is he his eyes on the space Watches me, his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me, and I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free, for his eyes on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. your heart be troubled his tender word I hear and resting on his goodness I lose my doubts and fear
Gigi Novell, Dr. Novell, to sing in your church, wedding, or anywhere else you want her, contact LLVN and ask for Jay Hughes, and he will put you in touch with Dr. Novell. Thank you, and God bless you. I, um, I preach overseas, and we have an appeal song at the end of every sermon. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do very good this last time. You know, someone else planned them all. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a singer with me like I try to. We had saxophones one time. We had other things, you know, not lovely, but not touching the heart. Right. And then the last Sabbath, you know, 1,500 people there, local pastor's wife, wonderful soprano voice. But she had a high D at the end. I mean, it was a show-off, what-I-can-do song. Mm -hmm. Lovely lady, lovely song. But I risked a little to talk to her, and I said, my friend, you know, that was fantastic. But if you want God to use you to sing an appeal song, that's what we, yeah. that was an appeal song. Yeah. Where you hear the words and you can remember the words and God can use those words to touch your heart. His eye is on the sparrow. Everyone remembers it. And let Jesus do and it. And your heart is moved to God. Let so, Jesus do it. Amen. Thank you, Gigi. Amen. Thank you. Well, we're going to take a short break. Let's hear what Bob Blancato has to tell our viewers here on LBM. Bob? Thanks to you, we are able to do this special four-part series, Gracer Grit. For more than 20 years, LLBN, in partnership with you, has been broadcasting inspirational programs like this to the world, reaching 146 nations and more than 50 million households. Today, we have three items of good news to share with you. First, through hard work, strong stewardship, and two decades of experience, LLBN has achieved a per hour broadcast rate of $150, an exceptionally low cost unmatched by any commercial or Christian TV broadcaster. Your donation today of $150 takes worship and fellowship to millions worldwide for one hour. And there are some who are willing to support a partial or a full day of LLBN broadcasting, even an entire week of LLBN. Second, our new LLBN Great Commission Broadcast Center is underway in partnership with you. Let's work together to prepare more souls for Christ's kingdom. Your donation of $150 empowers LLBN to take God's inspiring message of forgiveness and hope further by producing more programs like Grace or Grit, using all the attributes and benefits of television. Third, and the best news of all, Jesus is coming again, soon. Together, let's encourage viewers to invite Christ into their lives, perhaps leading to baptism, and fulfill his great commission to his disciples, as described in Matthew 28. Please prayerfully consider supporting LLBN at the $150 level, a very smart investment that's absolutely precious in ministering to those who have accepted Christ and millions more who haven't. Thank you for your prayers and financial support that keeps LLBN providing programs like Grace or Grit. And thank you, Bob. We're back here with our five final moments with Pastor Dan Smith. I think we all have a responsibility as believers to share the good news of Jesus around the world. 
Not everyone can preach like Dan Smith. Not everyone can have a TV station like LLBN. But I suppose we all can play our parts on how we can make it happen. Hmm. Some can, some does it through volunteering their efforts. Others who have given financial gifts to the ministry so it can grow and advance to share the message of Jesus. And then others simply remember us in their prayers. I say simply, but yet not so simple, because that is the most powerful thing that can achieve almost all things. And we hear at LBN, we do submit to Jesus and let him guide us and let him drive us. Um, but the enemy has fought us on many, many fronts. I was listening to your sermon while I was sitting over there, and I'm thinking, how truthful. You know, there has been so many wars and sometimes rumors of wars <laughs> against us that just shook us down to our core. No. But at the end, Jesus worked it out. In the end, he always worked it out. We didn't learn that right away, but time after time after time, the battles were too many and the waves of wars were way too overpowering for us to deal with. We, we learn it slow. We learn, we it, learn slow. it slow. But I, no, yeah. no single war had destroyed us. And that's the How many years now? It. This is 20 plus, about 23 plus. Okay. And remember, we had years in the development prior to that. So it's been about 25 years of our lives. But the wars have always been defeated because God has always never, never let his people fall in a pit hole. And, and that's the message I want to share with our viewers as a testimony for those of us like Pastor Dan, Dan and ourselves here who battle to advance the word of God. It's not just a cakewalk. There are days are, are simple and beautiful and successful, but there are many speed bumps and many challenges. But somehow God overcomes it. And we learned over the years to submit to his power and rely on it. To do what Jehoshaphat did. I mean, Jehoshaphat went to the temple and said, God, we have nothing. We are surrounded. We have no power ourselves. Our eyes are on you. And he goes out to the people and he says, watch what God's going to do. Somehow he's going to make this work. And they put a choir out in front and they come out in the morning and everyone's dead yeah. and none of them are lost. And yeah. God wins a victory. If we could just remember that day after day, yes, right. our eyes are on you, the battle is the Lord's, somehow it will work. And it's easy to drift away from him, but we have to bring ourselves back as yeah. much as we can. Less than 30 seconds, what a, what a final spiritual appeal you have for our viewers out there. I, I, I think we just said that, is, is um, rather than trying to fight the battle in your own armor, which we tend to do, Satan is big and powerful, and I'm... And, and sometimes the longer you're in the faith, the more you think you can fight the battle. Yeah. And to say, no, the battle is the Lord. Let me trust God to make this work. Yeah. See you tomorrow night. Let, let go of the arrogance. <laughs> Be humble and rely on God and Jesus. He's the way. He's the path. And without him, all things are possible. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for being with us A today. Blessing. Thank you, dear friends, for joining us. This program will continue tomorrow. Join us at 6 p.m. Same time here.